Hello everyone. Um, the topic for today's lecture is web APIs. So we're continuing our discussion of how to collect data and how to do data science using uh, web technologies. And so uh, here are the objectives for today's lecture. Um, the first one is we'll talk about how to access APIs and interact with them using R. Um, and then we'll see how often uh, the data that's that comes out of API uh, is in the form of JSON. So we'll learn the basics of JSON. And, uh, and then the third objective is to be able to compare and contrast two different strategies for collecting data on the web, namely web scraping, which is what we've been doing these past uh, two weeks, and APIs, which is the topic of today's lecture. So <clears throat> last week, we talked a little bit about the ethics of web scraping. Um, and in particular, we talked about how uh, when doing web scraping, we're using server resources. And so in that sense, um, to be a good uh, web citizen, we have to be respectful of those resources and not to abuse them. And so um, some websites actually provide a way to interact with their data using uh, what are called APIs, so application programming interfaces. And so that's one way to address this issue of being respectful of server resources um, by using this point of entry that's monitored and controlled. Uh, but also APIs are usually well documented. And so it gives us a way, uh, a well documented way of accessing data as opposed to trying to figure out the structure of a web page and try to extract the data we want. <clears throat> so uh, let's start with a couple definitions. So I've used the word API a few times now, um, and it's an acronym, which stands for Application Programming Interface. What this means is that APIs allow us to interact with the web application using a programming language. Um, and then the second definition that's going to be helpful for us is REST, R-E-S-T, which stands for Representational State Transfer. And it's a protocol for APIs. It's probably the most popular one. And uh, what essentially what this means is that resources um, on the website or uh, data, uh, data sets are referenced via URLs. And their representations, so the, the representation of this uh, resource in the form of data is transferred via an HTTP request. Um, and then an API that follows those um, the, the standard, so the REST standard, is usually called the RESTful API, which is a, a nice um, a nice term here. But you can see because for RESTful APIs, the data is transferred via an HTTP request. You can see how um, our discussion earlier about the different types of HTTP requests and how to um, post for, uh, or send, for example, a GET request using the HTTR package, uh, you can see how this discussion will become helpful in order to interact with APIs. Now, you may be wondering, why would a website provide an API? Why would they want to make it easier for people to interact <coughs> with their data? Um, well, the first, the first reason, as I said, is that APIs uh, can be controlled. And so it's a way for uh, websites to um, give access to a particular or a smaller subset of their web resources and control who can access them. Um, the other reason is that actually um, websites will, will have APIs <coughs> by default. And uh, nowadays, that's a very common way of structuring websites. And so, for example, here, if you think about an, uh, an API provider or a website, something like Twitter. Um, and if you think about your Twitter feed, uh, you can think of this as uh, a list of tweets that satisfy a certain set of criteria. For example, um, you're following the people who tweeted these or uh, you follow someone who retweeted or liked a particular tweet. And so you can think of um, a website organizing um, this this thread or this uh, feed as um, querying a database, collecting a set of tweets, and then displaying them. So this this idea or this way of structuring uh, a website 
um, is a very powerful one, a very flexible and scalable one. And so websites already have those APIs uh, built so that they can better maintain their websites. And so for them, it's a matter of making uh, decisions about which APIs will be um, available for outsiders. <clears throat> and so you can see this in this, uh, in this picture where the web application um, and the web service or the data API are already communicating with one another or interacting with one another. And then it's just a matter of making some of them available to the public. And so th these are the horizontal arrows. And then us, the user software, uh, we can, for example, using R, we can interact with those APIs and, and collect the data we want for data analysis. Or maybe we want to develop a, a different application using this data. OK. So before we start with an example, let's quickly go over the pros and cons. Um, so I've already alluded to some of those, but uh, in the advantages column, um, first of all, usually there's good documentation for APIs on how to access data and what kind of data can be accessed, uh, which is not the case for when we do web scraping. Um, web scraping is a lot more time consuming or um, requires a lot of, uh, of input from the, the scraper itself. Uh, second is that the, the data is usually structured very often, while well, the two most common um, formats would be XML, so extended uh, markup language, or JSON, which is what we'll see uh, in a few minutes. So by having structured data, then there's less cleaning up to do. And then of course, um, it's more respectful of server-side resources. Uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, this is the, those APIs are usually encapsulated in a way that um, uh, accessing them does not necessarily impact the, the, um, the website itself. In terms of disadvantages, well, um, because a website is controlling the, the data they give access to, um, the data you want or the data you need may not be part of it. So sometimes APIs won't give you the, the data you're looking for. And uh, also um, a, dis a disadvantage is that not all APIs are free. Uh, for example, uh, Google Maps, there's an API for Google Maps, but um, you usually need to pay a certain fee for querying this API, or at least um, past a certain amount of queries. Whereas scraping, of course, is usually free. Okay, so let's start with the first example here. Um, a lot of governments um, in the past decade uh, have, been, have made some of their data available online. Um, the Canadian government has uh, something like this. Uh, the city of Winnipeg has a lot of open data, and we'll look at one example later. But the example I have here is from the Colorado government. And so if you go to this website, data.colorado.gov, you'll see they have lots of data sets available. And for most of those data sets, they even give uh, access to it through APIs. So we'll focus on just one, but feel free to explore this, uh, this website if you're looking for more data or if you're just curious. But the data we'll look at today is uh, data on population projections. And so you can see here I have the URL, <clears throat> um, which is the URL that gives us access to, those, um, to this data set or this API. And then it's a matter of looking at the documentation to see um, how we can interact with it. And in particular, if we click on this link, uh, the second link here on the slide, you'll see that we can, for example, specify the county for which we want to look at the population projections. And the way to specify this in our query is to um, add URL parameters. <clears throat> so let's look at an example. Just like we did a couple weeks ago, we're going to send our HTTP request using the HTTR package in R. And you can see that I just start by um, creating a base URL, which is the URL where the API lives in some way. 
Um, so that's the same link as we had on the previous slide. And you can see that it ends with a question mark because that's, remember, that's how we uh, specify URL parameters. We put a question mark and then the URL parameters come after uh, in the form of key equals value. So we'll start uh, simple. We'll just add one parameter and we'll we'll pass a county equals boulder. So you can see here using the paste zero function, I'm just adding those uh, parameter at the end of the base URL. Once we have the full URL, we can send a get request using the get function. To make sure that the, the request was successful, we can look at the code. We get a 200, which means that it's successful. And then um, we can look at the type of data we received. And so if we look at this uh, data, dollar sign headers, dollar sign content type, you can see that we received something called JSON. So that's the type of data we received. <clears throat> and then there's also, a, they also specify the encoding because JSON is a text format, uh, but we'll, we'll ignore this bit for, uh, for now. So what is JSON? Right. We need to understand this a little bit better in order to be able to understand the data we just received. So JSON, again, is an acronym. It stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Um, and yes, it's related to JavaScript, but it's also uh, independent of it. So it doesn't mean we will have to learn JavaScript to understand JSON uh, formats. Um, what is, so what is JSON? As I said, it's a text-based uh, format for data, and it's a common way to share structured data across the web in a way that's uh, easy to read for humans and also easy to read for computers. And the, the way it's structured is that it gives us key value pairs that are grouped using curly braces. And then you can, you can think of this again as a tree structure, just like HTML. Uh, but the good thing for us is that uh, some people have built our packages that can take JSON data <clears throat> and then read it and parse it and convert it to um, our objects that are easier to work with. Um, the simplest way <clears throat> uh, JSON could be uh, parsed is in data frames. So when we're lucky, uh, we'll get a data frame. Uh, but sometimes we have to work a bit harder. But we'll, we'll look at both, both examples. Um, and so here's an example here of uh, a subset of a JSON uh, data set. <clears throat> and you can see here we have one, two, three, four, five, six uh, key value pairs. Um, and um, you can see that they're uh, enclosed in curly braces. And we could have, for example, a comma after the closing brace here, and then a second set of six key value pairs. And if we have key, a set of key value pairs like this, they're all the same. And uh, you can think of this one as being a row in a data set, for example. So hopefully you can imagine how this could be converted to a data frame with six columns and as many rows as we have uh, of these blocks inside the curly braces. And so if we go back to the examples, we, the example we had, uh, we can see that actually it, it's, it, it's in this format and we can convert it to a data frame. And the package we'll use for this is called JSON Lite, <clears throat> which is a very powerful package for parsing JSON in R. So remember earlier we, um, we sent a GET request. <clears throat> we got back some data in the format of JSON and we can read the data we received using the content function, which is in the HTTR package. And then we can specify that we want to read the content as text because uh, the JSON, again, is a text format. So the output of this content data uh, as equal text will be a very long string <coughs> containing all of the JSON data. And the from JSON function We'll take this very long string and convert it to an R object. Uh, and the, the assumption is that it will make it as simple as, as, as possible. So now data is an R object. It's no longer just a string. 
And if we use the is.data.frame function, we can see that actually it is a data frame. So that's good. We were able to successfully convert it to a data frame. Next, we can look at the names, so the column names of this data set to see what it looks like. And you can see there's nine columns. There's ID, county, uh, FIPS code, etc. <clears throat> and all of those columns are documented on the API website uh, if you want to look at it. So we've successfully extracted data from this API. <clears throat> you can also look, um, so if you look at the documentation, you can see that we can filter the data using URL parameters directly. Um, and here I'm, I'm just putting a note, but we'll, we'll see this on the next slide. Uh, those queries will usually have spaces, and so you need to be aware that you have to properly encode those URL before sending the GET request. Otherwise, you'll, you'll get error, errors. So here's an example here. Um, again, that's from the documentation. You can see that you can pass a WHERE um, clause, a bit like SQL. And you can specify that we want a data set or, or data points where the age is between 20 and 40. So those population projections are broken down by age categories. <laughs> and so you can see here my query or my uh, URL has some uh, spaces in it. So the URL encode function will take care of properly encoding this URL. And in this case, what it means is that it replaces those spaces by um, the percentage sign followed by 20. And so you can see that uh, if I look at just the end of the fully encoded URL, you can see that instead of age space between space 20, all of those spaces have been replaced by percentage 20, right? So age, percentage 20, between percentage 20, 20, percentage 20, etc. So now that we have a properly encoded URL, we can send a GET request. Uh, we can again check the status to make sure that we had a successful request and we get a 200 code. So that's okay, that's good. And next we can um, extract this content in the text format just as before. And then using the from JSON function, um, convert it to an R object. And just as before, because the data is in the same format, we get a data frame. And we can make we can just check whether um, the age variable is indeed in the correct range between 20 and 40. And indeed, if we run range and then as dot numeric, um, open parentheses data dollar sign age we'll see that we get uh, from 20 to 40. So the range of ages is exactly what we, um, what we wanted. Okay, so I have an ex an, a quick exercise here. Feel free to pause and, and spend as much time as you need on this uh, exercise. But I want you to look at the documentation on this, uh, on this page here and try to build an, a URL that will select uh, only three of the variables instead of nine. And the three variables uh, I'm interested in are year, age, and female population. And then uh, make sure you also keep the previous query where age was constrained between 20 and 40 years old. Once you've successfully built this uh, URL and you send a GET request and you get the, the data frame, uh, use the return data to plot uh, population projections over time. So where you would have female projection on the y-axis, uh, sorry, female population, and year uh, age on the, sorry, year on the on the x-axis. So year on x-axis, female population on the y-axis. Okay, so I hope you gave this a try. <clears throat> Let's look at the solution together. So if you look at the documentation, you can see that uh, just, just as we had where, a where clause for filtering the data, uh, it's a, we're, we're able to send a select clause to select the variables we want. And so the URL parameter we need to pass is um, dollar sign select, 
equal to year comma age comma female population and so um, we can now build a full URL using uh, all the pieces we had earlier so county equals Boulder uh, where equals age between 20 and 40 and then the new URL parameter which is select equals year age female population Again, we have those uh, special characters that we need to properly encode. So we run the URL encode function. Next, we can send a get request to receive the data, check the status quo uh, code, and we have uh, 200 code, which means it's okay. We can convert the JSON data we received uh, into a data frame. So data now is a data frame and um, to be able to plot it as uh, as required we need to change things a little bit so we need to mutate the variables to numeric because they were all in text uh, so character strings so to do this we'll import the tidyverse package <coughs> which will give us the tidyverse functions and then we'll simply use a mutate so uh, year equals as dot numeric year we'll change all of those years to uh, numbers as opposed to strings and similarly for age and female population once we've uh, mutated those variables to numeric we can use ggplot to plot those uh, projections so on the x-axis we have year on the y-axis female population and then uh, you can do this in a few different ways, but we'll use a geom line so that we'll get uh, line projections or line graph for each uh, or for each age group. And so in order to have different lines for all of those groups, we need to, uh, for all of these ages, we need to specify group equal age. And then to be able to distinguish between the different age groups, we'll also give a different color. So we'll, we'll pass those two aesthetics, group equals age and color equals age. So if you do this, we get this, uh, this line graph here. Um, and I'll let you interpret it, but it seems like there's a lot of uh, translation happening. So probably the projections in one year um, probably influence or are probably very highly correlated with projections in, um, in a different age. So projections for 35 year olds is probably very closely related to projections for 34 years old. Okay, so that was the solution for this, um, this exercise. Um, <clears throat> let's look at a different API. And this API, we'll see it has two, uh, two different characteristics um, that are helpful to know about when we do, uh, when we interact with APIs. So we'll use the Winnipeg Transit API. And I'm just going to follow the example they have on their, uh, on their website, so in their documentation. So if you click on this link here, you can see the example. I've just adapted it to, um, to R. <coughs> Um, this API to access it you actually need to register and what they'll do is that they'll send you uh, an API key and this API key you'll need to pass it as a URL parameter for each of your of your uh, requests and for them it's a way to control who has access to the API but also they can control how many times you query per per minute for example and put limits on those so the first example uh, we'll look at is uh, we'll use their API to find the nearby stops, <coughs> right? So the bus stops. What we need to pass for, for this is we need to pass a longitude and latitude, uh, so coordinates, spatial coordinates. And then we need to pass another parameter called distance, which will be the radius uh, within which we're looking for nearby stops. So you can think of a circle of radius distance centered around uh, the, the longitude and latitude coordinates. And so this is how we can do this in R. So first of all, um, I'm, I'm just, I don't want to share my API key with everyone in the slides. So I've, I saved that API key in an environment variable. Um, and that environment variable, I called it Winnipeg token. <clears throat> so here on the first line, I'm just retrieving that API key and saving it into uh, an R object called token. Next, uh, we can build this base URL. 
which is um, the, the, the URL that we see here. The V3 uh, corresponds to this third version of the API. And then stops.json um, corresponds to the particular um, end, end point that we're interested in. So in this case, because we want stop information, that's the API we want to interact with. Next, I'll build a full URL uh, by passing my, um, my URL parameters. Here I'm passing a long longitude and a latitude. <clears throat> um, those coordinates correspond to the corner of Portage and Main, but feel free to change those um, to something that's perhaps more relevant to you. And distance here is 250, which means we're going to look within a radius of 250 meters. And then the last um, URL parameter we need to pass is the API key. So API hyphen key equals, and then I'm passing token, which is the variable um, keeping track of my API key. Um, this URL doesn't need to be encoded further because there's no space in it. Um, so I can just directly call um, the get function to send a get request. Again, we can check the status to make sure everything is correct. Uh, we get 200, which is good. And then uh, we can extract the data using um, a JSON, uh, from JSON function. And this time, actually, uh, we were not able to, um, to get a data frame right away, just because of the way the, the data is structured. So for example, so what we get is a list. And the list has two components. The first one is the stops, which is the data we're interested in. And the second one is a query time, which is um, keeping track of when I sent the query. But if we look at just the stops element, this one is actually a data frame. So if we use the glimpse function, we can look at uh, data dollar sign stops. And we can see that we get a data frame with 21 rows in nine columns. So within 250 meters of that point, there was uh, nine different stops. And we can see the names of those stops and the number and direction. Um, so this, if, if you're familiar with this uh, location in Winnipeg, those names probably mean um, something. And in particular, we can um, pull the the name from those stops so I'm just pulling that the name variable from the data dollar sign stops data frame and we get uh, all all the names of those stops so eastbound portage at main westbound portage at main etc and you can see there's 21 different stops so that's the first endpoint that we're going to look at uh, for that one uh, remember it's for uh, finding stops nearby a certain location. The second endpoint we'll look at is how to pull stop schedules. Um, so for a particular stop, how can we find the schedules for the, the next, uh, the next um, buses coming? Um, the way it's structured, and again, you can look at the documentation to figure this out, <coughs> is that each stop has a different endpoint. And we'll see what I mean uh, when we look at the URL itself. But for example, stop uh, 10541 um, has a specific endpoint and it stops uh, slash 10541. And the parameter we'll be interested in is the max results per route. So how many, uh, how many results do we get for each route that's passing through uh, this particular stop? So, for a particular stop, there's going to be a different number of buses coming in. And then for each bus, when are the next two stops? So let's look at the, the at this, um, this request. So first, again, we'll, we're going to build the base URL. Now you can see what I meant uh, by the endpoint. We have a slash stops slash 10541. So you would change that number if you wanted a different stop and then slash schedule.json. So that's our base URL. We're going to add URL parameters to this. The first one, as I said, is the max results per route, and we'll take two. And then the second um, 
URL parameter is the API key, just as before. Once we have this full URL, we don't need to encode it because there's no space. We can send a get request. We get back a, a resource. We can check the code. It's 200, okay, we can go on. We have our data. And next, we can parse the JSON from text into an R object. <clears throat> and um, we get we get again um, a list in this case um, this list is a lot more complex because there's a lot of different levels i'll let you explore what it looks like but for example if you wanted to extract the arrival times for um, a particular stop or a particular route this is sort of the structure of the data so the first level you would need to pick the stop schedule element and then the route schedules, and then scheduled stops, <laughs> and then you'll see a list of different routes. I'm just picking the first one here uh, as an example. And from this first one, you can pick out the times, and then finally the arrival times, as opposed to departure times. And what we get here are two different, um, so a data frame with two columns, the scheduled arrival time and the estimated arrival time. And because we had a max, um, we, we, we had a max parameter of just two, um, two stops per routes. This is why we only get two, um, two rows here. <clears throat> and as a bonus exercise, and for this, you need to really dig into the data that comes out of the JSON and see how it's structured. Uh, you can try to transform data into a table with three columns. So the first one would be the route name. The second column would be the expected arrival time. And the third column would be the estimated arrival time. So you can try this exercise. I think it's a good one for uh, practicing your, your data cleaning skills. And it will also force you to look at the structure of this uh, data uh, object and see what it looks like. <clears throat> so we're, we're almost done. The last thing I want to point out is that um, not, you don't always have to do all of this data cleaning on your own. So sometimes um, there's already an R package that uh, does the cleaning up for you and uh, does the interaction with the API for you. And so I encourage you to look at those R, pa R packages uh, first before trying to code everything uh, yourself, just because it's going to save you some time and, and potentially pain as well. Um, so here I'm just sharing three examples. Um, R tweet is a, a good R package for collecting Twitter data which will uh, allow you to uh, put in your, your authentication criteria, uh, tokens. Um, and also the data is going to be in a, in a good format for analysis. So R, the RTweet package is a very good package for Twitter data. And then uh, the other two here, um, so R NOAA is an R package to interact with the NOAA weather data API. And then the trade statistics is... Um, Again, an R package to interact with the API for open trade international data. So th those are just three examples uh, picked more or less at random. Um, but yes, I encourage you to look out for those for those packages if you're trying to access data from an API that's um, well established. So in summary, uh, we talked about web APIs and how we can use them to um, extract data. <laughs> And so um, we talked about why websites would build APIs and why they would also um, make, them, make some of them available to uh, outside users. Um, one thing we didn't have much time to talk about, I mean, we, we talked a bit about it, but APIs often require registration. So we need to use an API key. And the reason for this most often is to keep track of your usage. So. Um, wh how many queries are you sending, who is sending them, that sort of thing. So they can make sure that uh, nobody abuses the API. Um, authentication can sometimes be more, more complex than what we had. So the setting with the Winnipeg Transit API was quite simple, where the API was just sent uh, as part of the URL. Uh, but sometimes you need uh, much more complex authentication procedures. <clears throat> so look at the documentation on the APIs and see um, and see uh, how the authentication works. And then of course some APIs are not free, so <clears throat> keep that in mind as well when you want to interact with them. Uh, you may have to um, 
put in a credit card number. And uh, whenever possible, we should prefer APIs over scraping just because uh, it's more respectful of server resources and also, also it's uh, better documented. So you know what to expect uh, and it's also um, less prone to uh, your code breaking because of a change in how the website looks.